Thank you for being here. You're here on a special day, I'll tell you that. Why is it not working, Josie? <laughs> they don't want to be locked into a, a house or an apartment. Got to follow the social distancing rule. And some nuff dicks were getting tested, then going in and doing a shop. <laughs> COVID. I had it. Detective so, George Bennett. Yeah, he's a bellend, absolutely. George, don't say hello to you. Like I don't know, I'm, I'm actually genuinely embarrassed. I broke my back. A vertebrae or, or oh. a portion? Spinal. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, jo- Josie, just do that. Do that thing where you just put Bill's talking. Let me see. I can hear him first. Hey, fellas. Yeah. Hey, Good news. Good news. Tour de France is over. We're going to have to talk about that oh. shit anymore. <laughs> I bet mean, you're oh, feeling nothing about George. Oh, yeah, Flying, mate. Flying on a high podium in, podium in Paris. <laughs> Do you know what, like, <clears throat> what was uh, interesting today was, like, my teammates, oh, we were talking about recovery rides, and uh, I went on the bike today, and my, and my teammates never believed me that I could do a ride under 100 watts. I averaged 74. <laughs> 74 what, what is, watts today. What does that mean? Is that that mean, that means he'd be able to just, maybe be able to run one light bulb, like one of those real small light bulbs, yeah. like over the mirror. Oh, yeah. yeah, like you normally average at least double, but normally triple. And I was just so broken. I got on my bike and I did like two pedal strokes, and then I just freewheeled until I got to the speed where I was like going to fall off. And then you do like another couple of pedal strokes, and I just do did you, that. Do like you find that one once once the tour is over, obviously you're physically pinned. But I I used to find even just from the mental side doing the videos oh. and that once once you let go you just fall in a heap you need three and, or four days of just doing nothing how weird is it like i got it this morning and i was like i can i can do whatever i want like and then i was just waiting i was like there's no time to go to bed like i was in the bed last night waiting for the day plan to come through and then you're like you yeah. get up and you walk up to the kitchen you're like i can eat breakfast when i want and then i get to the pan and the oats see the oats in the pan and i'm like these bear some these have some relationship to each other and you sort of just you just like what was this and then you like go to do the washing and you're like fucking washing what doesn't they just put it in a bag and it comes back <laughs> what's going on here <laughs> oh yeah it's bloody weird because you're just you, you're like robot you're literally like robots how yeah. they're gonna go down yeah. if i gave my wash bag to caitlin and see and then i was like, oh, yeah, just chuck it outside the door when you're done <laughs> just <laughs> And the worst is when you get your clothes back and they're not hundred percent dry. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Mm. And you're hanging them over. I'll just be hanging. You'll see me next episode. There's just like you know how you hang them over like your light bulbs and stuff in your hotel room. I'll just be sporadically hanging clothes around my house to try and dry them. We almost burnt down the leper bed one year because yeah. Vi- Vicus put his kid over the light and it caught fire. <laughs> Miza did the same thing once. Went yeah. to went to, went to dinner, came back to the room, was like. Smells funny. <laughs> t-shirt was bu- a hole burning in his t-shirt because it's hanging over the light. Like like, it was, at least uh, we're going to do that. Light off. Uh, I, uh, we got a fucking huge show. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things I thought I was going to commit to is not swearing as much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> conversation. yeah, I said I was going to stop dropping F-bombs to substitute the word and. <laughs> well, you're off, to, you're well, off to a fucking good start. Well, there's di- the thing is what I try to explain to people is there's different levels of swearing. Like if you're aggressive saying, hey, F you or whatever, yeah, that's offensive. But, you know, if you're talking about a ride or whatever and you go, man, I was fucking pinned. Well, that that's all right. Yeah. Surely that's re- all right. There's relevant swearing. For sure there's relevant swearing. Well, one thing yeah. you guys might have seen is a comment on my Instagram post that, that dropping C-bombs and, and it was because um, – not for me, but for, uh, what it was is I was trying to explain to my teammates how a sea bomb in New Zealand is can be a term of endearment. Like if you're a, a, a GC, you know what I mean? It's like, whereas in America, it's the worst. Like that word is is, is such yeah. a bad word. And in Australia yeah. and New Zealand, it can be a bad word in, a, in the right context, but it's, it's also can be like, oh, no, he's a real GC. It's a real term of endearment, you know what I mean? But that that word is undoubtedly banned from the show. I mean, we're we're pretty <laughs> yeah, yeah. we're pretty loose. Yeah. We're pretty we're very unfiltered. Um, yeah. You know, pe- people seem to enjoy it. We haven't really gotten too much trouble over the times. 
but we will we we, we should remain um re- well, the thing remain is, is we're not live so if if it, if one does get through then our editors and He's not doing the, his job. The, the best was those episodes when you'd have to do the 10 minute debrief after the show to go back over everything that was said, John. <laughs> Who do we think? The, the third umpire. What, what, what are we getting? A green light? Red light? Oh, geez. I think, I think you're safe. I think you're safe. How, we but, never do, we never really do any editing, do we? Like this thing, we record this thing. It's on YouTube 20 minutes later, basically, and on all the yeah. other places. Yeah, because we're good guys. You know, we're not going to be offensive. Like we're, no. We just have to be ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Should we, I can be quite offensive. Do you want to unpack the tour a little bit, George? Are you over it? I'm a bit over it, but, you know, whatever. Well, my, maybe we could put it to bed. Maybe we could unpack it here and, and I yeah. can get some closure. Yeah. yeah. Look okay. at me and oh. Sam as like we're your uh, therapy guardians. And, um, okay. yeah, just, just get off, get off your chest, mate. Do you want to Do go you know and lie down on the couch first or something? I have been lying down on the couch. I just came from there. I've been lying we, should, there. Um, we should actually unpack, talk a little bit about the tour because we have got a pretty good guest coming on shortly. We've cast a line out. Um, mm. and he's going to come on and give us a real insight into the tour. And uh, what it's like to, to really ride. To be good at the tour. Yeah. Need to be good at the tour. See none. Oh, yeah. We'll get two perspectives. We'll get yours and his. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could at least do like what it's like to finish the tour between me and you. We could get those two perspectives at the moment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I found out. I found out yesterday. I got another broken bone. I thought it was just the one in the wrist, but I've actually got another one. I tried to go on the road yesterday at training. I was like, why the. F is my um, arm so oh, sore. No, 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 no. You can swear, Sam. Okay. If you want to say it's fucking sore, that's fine. We've cleared oh, yeah. this. Oh, so yeah. If you start turning this show into this sensitized, oh, fruit or oh, whatever. No, mate. Yeah. Forget it. it. Was... Just tell, you, tell your story again. All right, I'll start over. So I, I, I went to bed two nights ago and I was all motivated. I was excited, you know. I was like, oh, I reckon I'm ready to get on the road. So I cut my cast off, which I tell you, it's not that easy. I thought, I thought a pair of scissors, I'd be able to just cut this pl- plaster off. Took me, took me about half an hour, forty minutes. Finally got the thing off. Put this little brace on, which you guys won't be able to see when you if you're listening. But there's a brace on my arm now. And what I and found I, interesting about that is that you already had an assortment of braces from previous yeah. breaks. You were just like, okay, <laughs> left hand scapula. Okay, yeah, yeah, we'll put this one on, and then. Oh yeah, I, I had like a it was like a buffet of braces. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, so I was like, oh, I'll go on the road. Woke up yesterday morning all up and about. Yes, beauty. It's Monday. Start of a new week. Start of a new era. Let's start the prep. Let's get back. Let's start, you know. It's go, Bills. Come on, mate. Fire and up. I, uh, I like, so I was like, oh, I'll go on the erg. motivated. <laughs> get on the erg and do 15 minutes just to, you know, just to see if I can, how the brace handles, you know, with braking, moving out of the seat, turning the handlebars a little bit. I was like, on there for about five minutes, I was like, why the fuck is it so sore, the bone that's not broken? Why is that so sore? I, I don't understand. So I went back and had a look at the x-ray, and I was like, I'm no doctor. You know, I, I, I might be more qualified than whatever his name was from The Simpsons. Um, Dr. Doctor. Nick. Dr. Dr. Nick. Hey, hey everybody. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, I was like, it doesn't look right. So I sent the x-ray through to the team doctor, and I was like, just to confirm, the bone that I broke is over here, no? And he's like, yeah, but uh, that one over there is also broken. Uh, so you've actually got two breaks in your wrist. So now I'm, I was flat as a shit card as hat, and now I'm back on the erg for another week. Um, last last night we went for a beer, Jonesy, and uh, yeah. he was sitting there with me and Novi, and basically got to the point where it's like, you know, like you know, you know, I was just so just like you guys don't know what it's like starting the tour and not getting to Paris, and I was sitting there like. I pulled out in 2017, and then Nobby's sitting there like, I also yeah. broke my pelvis. Broke my pelvis. Out. Like, Almost ended oh, my yeah. career. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't Paul know what Arsenal. it's like. <laughs> yeah. You don't but, know the pain. <laughs> like, I, what, I, I, what Tour de France pain would you know, Bennett? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what do you got to win about? Have, George, you don't, have, you don't have broken ribs. Like, you've only got one broken rib. <laughs> it, it, must be, it must be a shit feeling when you're a doctor, though, and one of your athletes comes back and they go, mate, you missed, you missed another break there. Like, this is a sort mm. of a bit of a fuck up. Well, I think they I, – I suspect they knew, I, and I just suspect that in my morphine-induced um, 
um, period that I didn't really, I just misunderstood what they told me. So, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, but uh, how you, you bounce back yet, GB? Yeah, obviously, that was a yeah. Bit of, I, I, I had, do you know what though? Like, the acute pain of it of, of us not winning was quite short lived, like, it was like it was pretty intense. Like, we were, um, we were sitting on the top of the um, actually, I've done something else this last night. We were sitting on the like at the camper van to fit, like because so the TT finished up a hill and the bus was at the bottom and so the team brought like another camper van for us to just have showers and stuff at the end at the top of the time trial and we were all sitting around watching on this iPad and then we saw sort of Pogacar come through and he was like 15 seconds up on the first check and everyone's like oh man this guy's gonna he's explode gonna like yeah. yeah he's pacing this and the next one he was like I think he was 35 seconds up at the next check or 40 seconds up here I went, man, he's, he's really holding on to this. Starts the climb, fastest time. And we're like, now he's just going to stop. It was, I think he was like 45 or 46, yeah, 45 seconds down at that stage. And then we saw how fast he was going up the hill. And we're like, and then everyone just went quiet, you know. And it was at that time when like, like we've had this um, documentary maker around us the whole tour. And um, you know, everyone's like, He's been he's really good. He's a real good guy and he's he's real respectful of the riders and he you know, but he but they are getting everything on camera. And then we were just sitting around around this iPad, like at the top of this hill watching it, and then everyone was just like stone quiet and we're like, Oh god. And you couldn't really like have any emotion, you know, because you're like, you know, the camera's on and all this stuff and we sort of didn't want to so we sort of I ended up just going for a bit of a walk, but I knew by then we'd lost. Yeah, all right. Oh, well, worst things happen. Worst things happen. Everyone's keeping it together. Like, oh, well, we tried, you know. Worst things happen at sea. Yeah, worst things yeah. happen at sea. All the stuff. And then at, at one rating. moment. Mm. And then and then just before we, yeah, yeah, oh, part of the sport, you know. Oh, well, mm. someone's got to win. All these cliches. And then, and then at one moment, um, I forgot something from the camper van. And I was like, oh, I've got to grab something. And I walked in and finally everyone had disappeared, you know, like everyone, no media, no cameras, no staff, nothing. And I walked in and it was just me and Walt in there. And then it just like simultaneously just hit us both like a ton of bricks, man. And I just lost it. I was like, oh, fuck, you know, like it was just like, like it wasn't, it wasn't like disappointment. It was just like, oh, I'm just shattered. And we just, invest, we're like, we've invested everything. We were like, disappointed in Primoz, but we were just like devastated for him, you know, and devastated for everyone else and all this stuff. So that was like, you know, that was real like tough moment. And then we, we had like a 200K or 250K transfer. So we had long time on the bus and that was a real long transfer. And then we got to the hotel and then Primoz came and everyone came around and then we ended up just, we said, oh, let's have a beer, eh? And they, <laughs> they brought us out this, one of those giant, um, like, gullets of leather. Oh, so they were about three leathers for a glass of beer. And we had a beer and then like after like 20 minutes we just started lightening up and then we sort of laughed, looked back and everyone was proud and then at the end it was like, oh, we didn't win. We couldn't win. That guy was just insane. What do you do? We didn't make any mistakes. We didn't, nothing went wrong. No one, like mm. Primos didn't crash. Primos didn't get sick. Didn't have a flat tire. Didn't miss a split. Everything like that went perfect. And like in the end this guy was just like, and Primoz, actually, people people talking about Primoz had a bad time trial. Mate, he did the best time trial he's ever done, his, numerically. He did an mm. insane time trial. Bigger numbers and a lot bigger than he pushed in the Vuelta, everything like that. Um, so in the end, I was like, what do you do? That guy was just too fast. And then once we sort of came to that, accepted that, it's, it's hard to be too disappointed if, like, someone was just way better than you. Mm. And, and now that's the kind of the thing I've come through and – so now, like, obviously, I've got the huge tour come down, which is inevitable, but it's not because we didn't win. It's it's because I'm just you got to do I'm your own sore. washing. Yeah, I'm I'm mm -hmm. sore. I've got to do my washing, um, and I've got another 500 race days before the end of the season. <laughs> 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 oh, mate, well, we're proud of you. We're proud oh, of you. Yeah. yeah. But like oh, how yeah. that that's sport, hey? Like how <clears throat> sport is like it's it is literally one of the most beautiful things in the world for a number of reasons. Like there must have been people all around the world what like feeling heartbroken for, for a guy they've never met, never will meet, you know. Mm. Um 
and then at the same time feeling like jubilation for this other guy that they've never met or never will meet. Meet. It just like brings these emotions. Sport just brings emotion. Eh? I just it's yeah. Unreal. I had a message from one of the from the All Blacks actually saying. Um, oh, mm, mm. Uh, no, 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 no. One of the old, one of the old he's, never, he's not part of the. He's not the cyclist, but he goes. He's an old. If he said, you know, "I feel like I don't know these people." Oh, here he is. Hold on. <laughs> there you go, special guest. We got a special guest. There he is. Richie. Richie Pork. Good day. How What's you, happening? Mate? What's happening? It's raining here. Unbelievable. Fuck. Well, we just heard the story from George, um, and it's obviously a bit of a heartbreaker. Um, so we, we thought, why not get Richie in and, and really lift the mood? <laughs> yeah, we need <laughs> a feel-good story. <laughs> we're all flat as shit cut of oh, pants right yeah. now. We need, we're glad to have you here talk about an actual success story. Although sure, you've gone mate. straight straight home to change your nappies, I suppose. Exactly. Straight into the set. Robbie McEwen said that. One minute you're on the podium, next minute you're up to knuckles and shit, and that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> that meant for me. It is, uh, it was brilliant. Wouldn't change it for the world. How how emotional was it when you when you got in the front door? I, I heard that uh, you didn't have your house keys, mate. Yeah, typical of me. Um, no, Gemma was all good. Uh, she had to to come down and uh, open up the door for me. It's uh, you know first time to uh, meet my little girl. Um, uh, it was pretty, pretty cool. Pretty cool day, to be fair. Mate, you imagine and when your daughter turns 21 at her 21st birthday and you'd be able to say to her, the old man was on the, standing on the podium in the Champs-Élysées when you were bloody a week old. Yeah. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's not, not a bad one, but, uh, no, I mean, it's, it's pretty tough, isn't it, to, to miss the birth, but... Um, it is what it is. and uh, I'm just so glad that it worked out for you. You know what I mean? Like, like I, you hear stories, imagine, like, I think I heard a few years ago, I think um, there was a rider on, um, he was on Emirates at the time, and I think his, like, it was a funeral of his, of his mother or something, and they, he couldn't go home to the funeral. And I was just thinking like this. And also, you know, there's a famous story of, of, of bark alarms and things that missed the birth and had to fly on the rest day. But then, like, if you were just, getting bottles or you're just whatever you kind of get to the end of it and go shit was that worth it but then the fact that you pull off a podium and you're like oh yeah okay well a week of yeah oh, okay what, what, birth, what but... george is trying to say is you took a risk <laughs> mate you took a big risk <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and you pulled it off yeah i mean normally i mean without covid everything was pretty well timed last time well for our son it was the same thing had taught a Swiss and I almost had to miss that because of the timing. So we absolutely nailed it like perfectly. And uh, yeah, then this happened. So um, no, it was a strange old year. Now, Richie, do you change nappies or are you just going, yeah, no, I'm, I'm back to nappy changing as soon as you go in the door and you're like, hey, I'm not going anywhere near that shit because I know what gag reflexes are like with that stuff, mate. I've been through the, the battle end and it's it's not pretty at times. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? It's like our son's two, two and a bit, and but you forget, you know, the the first few, you know, the, the baby ones, they kind of look like a vindaloo, don't they? You know? Oh, it's, it's shocking! Terrible, terrible the thing, the so. first ones from hospital are just jet black. It's crook. <laughs> yeah, <aren't they>? yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, that's another rumor I've heard actually is that Michael Matthews or Bling, as everyone knows him. Has never actually changed a nappy. He never did it. Oh. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. That well, right and, now. and the other thing you're going to find is I find like obviously you've got boy and now girl. I've got a boy and a girl. Boys' nappies are no dramas. Like yeah. you can get in there, scrape it out, yeah. whack around the nuts. But the girls are different, <laughs> mate. It's a different thing altogether. Yeah. It's horrific at times. If if they've if they've got a crook guts. And there's explosions. Um, it, it's bad, man. It's real bad. And it takes. It, it took me three months, like, to get over the gag reflex, like, to get to the point where I'm like, okay, I can handle any situation. But I just hang in there, mate. Just hang in there. And as you said, just get your knuckles dirty, and yeah. you'll be good. Mate, how, see we how, brought the podium, <laughs> yeah, podium in the Tour de France that. on, 
And then we talk to them about baby shit. I mean, is there anything <laughs> like, mean, bike racing you want to touch on or something, or we just <laughs> stick to baby shit? Uh, yeah, that's it. Cycling's all a bit boring, isn't it? So I tell you what, Mate, it's nice to go and ride without 160 other blokes, you know, trying to carve you up. And it's just like the nicest feeling, isn't it, after a grand tour, is just to, to get home and, you know, dealing with French drivers trying to put you off. But it's still better than having like a sauna, movie star and all these guys <laughs> trying to put you off. So good. I didn't even try and ride with anyone this morning. But yeah. I was just telling these boys, I managed to average under 80 watts today. But um, yeah, they're trying to explain to Jonesy how, how little that is. It's, it's, it's fuck all, really. And how are so, you, what? Wagon? How's Mate, I'm all right. Around? I'm all right. Oh, oh. I, I was just, just telling the boys before I, I uh, cut my own cast off the other day. I thought I was going to get on the road. And then I found out yesterday I got an, uh, another broken bone in there. So I've actually got two two breaks in the wrist, which is a bit of a pain in the ass. But I'm uh, I'm bouncing back, mate. I'm bouncing back. I want to actually ask you quickly. You just called me Wagon. So for a lot of people who listen to the show, no one will know this, but my nickname in New Zealand is Wagon. And it came from the track team. All the track all the track boys used to call me wagon, but pretty much no one in Europe calls me wagon except you, Richie. How how the hell do you get on the wagon bandwagon? I actually there we thought, go. It, huh. I thought it was because you ate so many wagon wheels, those awesome <laughs> dishes that you get. Yeah. The Arnold's, Arnold's wagon. That's what I thought. It was like. But I think it was like Heyman or someone was calling you, or it might have been Jesse Sargent, maybe. Oh, probably, yeah. Started, yeah, it would have been Goose Daddy. Trying to tweak my mind of why I, I rode with Bling this morning. I was like, "Why do we call him Wagon?" He goes, "I don't call him Wagon. I just call him Bules." Okay, <laughs> maybe it's just me. So, oh, you are, mate. You're one of the very few that call me Wagon. I love it yeah. because whenever whenever I hear someone in the bunch, yeah, like, "Hey, Wagon!" I always know. It's, I always know who it is. I always know to ride the other way. I always yeah. know to ride away from the noise. <laughs> hey, oh. so mate, what's the plan now? You've just after yeah. Uh, you got any more racing coming up, or you got a chance to sit down and have a couple of James Bogues, a couple of Tassie no, Lagers? Straight back Ch- into I'm doing welds. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. And then the Ardennes, but hopefully I'm finished after the Ardennes. Fingers crossed. Yeah, nice. Are you, are you going to be able to get home? Probably not, I suppose. Eh? You won't be able to get back to Aussie. No, I think, yeah, so obviously. I think Tasmania's going all right, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah there's been COVID down. there. Uh, New right. Zealand Island, we're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. The uh, <coughs> Western Island. It's a. Uh, I think it's to get back into Australia for us. It's like a one month quarantine. So you have to like two two weeks in Melbourne or Sydney, and then two weeks in Tassie. So oh, yeah, pretty Oof. much impossible. But don't yeah. worry if you if you had a two weeks in hotel quarantine, Victoria, we do a good job of that. So oh, do you, that, yeah. you, <laughs> you'd be fine. I'm feeling it. <laughs> Hey, Mate, just Richie, talk. I was just—I was just going to say—can you tell me the moment uh, when you found out your daughter was born? Like, what what happened there? We, was it in the race or was it after the race? I, I haven't done much research for this show. Yeah, so it was the crosswind <laughs> stage where we'd all lost time in our team, so it was kind of like a like a funeral procession. You know how it, it always is. We had a bit of a robust discussion because. We weren't there. We should have been. You know, every other team knew what was coming and we were a little bit on the back foot. But, uh, yeah, and I was on the massage table getting getting my rub and then, uh, yeah, it's got a, a message from my wife, a, a photo, and uh, it had all happened. But it was funny because, you know, she was at five centimetres. Anyone who's a, a parent knows what that means. But then, you know, within a couple of hours that the baby was born so by rights it should have been like another like five hour wait shouldn't it but then um next minute she was she was there so <laughs> it was uh no it was great right? just uh, it was a weird weird feeling though because then the yeah. next morning you go down to the breakfast table and i don't really like talking that much in the morning you know i tried to go to breakfast before everyone else and get a couple of coffees in me to to wake up and not have to talk to anyone but then everyone was coming over patting me on the back and uh it was quite nice but yeah then you have to talk to everyone don't you when they know you've, you've got a baby yeah i was watching you in the bunch the next day everyone just riding around patting you on the back it just as they come past full gas. <laughs> yeah exactly exactly it's it is funny though isn't it the guys that 
you know, you really can tell the guys that like you or dislike you when you when you know you have a baby or you get the podium. You know, even riding into Paris on Sunday, most of the guys were quite happy for me. But you know, there's still still a couple of guys. You know, that <laughs> uh, and there's this, there's one Astana rider who, no matter what happens. I think every time I ride past him, my teammates say his head wobbles like he has a bit of a head shake. I can't, I can't for the life of me remember what I ever did to him. I even asked him last year, hey, what have I ever done to piss you off? Like, why do you hate me so much? And, he, you know, he pretend like he didn't understand me, but he knows it. He knows who he is. <laughs> <laughs> but, That's um, awesome. We've all got one, don't we? Oh, no, oh, yeah. we've got a number of I've got of them. several. I've, I've, I've got more than one. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one thing: the three people sitting here talking to you, we were bloody stoked for you, mate. Like, oh yeah, you, like it's been a fucking long time coming, and you had that stage nine curse for a number of years, didn't you? We stage yeah. nine, you crash out two years in a row or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, and then finally, you, you know, we were talking about it the other day on on another show about how you you were quite sort of silent throughout this race. You're always there or thereabouts. And then not really until the last week, people started to go, oh, hang on a second, Richie mm. Port, he, he's up a podium here. But then you still had to close like a minute and a half or whatever it was on Lopez on that last TT. You mean Superman? Uh, Superman, Superman, yeah. On <laughs> Superman, yeah. So hard to get Clark Kent. But, Did um, he actually call himself that or not? Yeah, well, I don't know. I've been Another thinking minute. about this because this is, a, this is a real trend, right? So there's Superman Lopez. There's Nidoman Quintana, or there was. Um, there's Bell and, and Bennett. <laughs> there, no, but then there's King Milano, and Who's there's who, Sebastian Milano, the, the other Colombian, and then there's um, Hugita Monster. He, he's got all the merch, Hugita Monster. So all the Colombians have got these these outrageous nicknames, and they're, they're like pro wrestling names, and they make all the, they've all got merch, and they've all yeah. got like these. And and the best thing about Hugita Monster, which is my favorite one, because it's like he's about. <laughs> Three foot tall, and he's, he's you know he's just the but he is it's just such a cool nickname. The Hugita Monster is he says to um, on his Instagram there was this great post and it was like a photo of him and his his girlfriend and he's like oh me and Mrs Monster. So he goes, like, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't trans transcend into the misses that well. I don't think. No, it doesn't. Right, yeah, just going, really go. going back, going back quickly to Superman. You you had to close that minute and a half or a minute forty, or whatever. Obviously, like a lot of people knew, you know, that you've done some world class TTs over the years. Um, but it's still a big gap to close, eh? We you, you back you back yourself at that moment, or you're like, ah, oh, fuck, really? this is going to be a challenge. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I was kind of. I mean, I, I was pretty happy with fourth place, if I'm to be honest. But you know. Once you get into your groove, and I think by the the first time check, my my director said in the radio, you've taken forty eight seconds or something like this on him, which was then you know it's game on. But he can climb as well, so I thought maybe his strategy was to uh, lose a bit of time on the flat and then free wheel uh, into the bottom. Yeah, that's <laughs> the man on the climb, but he didn't. He uh, the, the poor little fella had a, a, a shocker. So uh, I mean. It was pretty awesome to, you know, you get 3K from the finish line to be as serious as we're going to be. And, and the director says on the radio, hey, Richie, you've got your dream, you know, you're going to be on the, the podium. That was, I mean, it's a, a pretty awesome feeling. I think, to be honest, I'll probably be a better, a nicer bloke now because it's sort of been one of those things that's always at the back of your mind of like being you know, close or whatever, but, but then for one reason or another, it hasn't happened. So it's been, you know, it's been a long time coming and yeah, I'm just so bloody over the moon, to be honest. It's a, it's, a, it's awesome. Billy, yeah. were you, were you pulling your Velcro as, as uh, oh, Richie was you, talking then? Could you like hear he's that? Say, he's saying this awesome bloody insight and all I can yeah. hear is you going, <laughs> like in the background. No, you bloody killed it. Oh, well. But, but um, like that. that's the level of the show, I suppose. Yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say, Richie, um, on the back of what you said before about you know going to breakfast and, and not wanting to talk to people in the mornings, how much better was this edition of the tour with the COVID restrictions? The fact oh, that mate. there was less chaos and you yes. know you could just worry about your own shit. 
I mean, this is the thing with like with cycling and cycling journalists is like a lot of them aren't really even credentialed. They're just you know, you know, live in their mum and dad's basements and type away. You know, they don't really see the light of day much. I mean, uh, it's that's the thing with cycling journalism. It's a lot of uh, personal opinion, I think, and you know, they're very quick to jump on you. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's some brilliant ones, but geez, there's some shocking cycling journalists out there and it's you know I, I think that's without naming names but it's the, the guys that never really achieved it and then they kind of blame it on the fact that they didn't dope and everyone else did there's just so many bitter twisted mm. people and mm. um, so yeah it's without all those sort of seagulls hanging around and without <laughs> you know there, there was hardly any people around well in Nice, that was the case. It got steady, you know, like there was a lot more people by the end of the tour hanging around the team buses and on the side of the road. But from that point of view, I really enjoyed it. It was like yeah, you know, doing like a, a Paris-Nice or, or, or the Dauphiné, you know, with less people around. And you know how it is, boys. Like you go to sign on and have to stop for selfies and all that rubbish with people who pay our salaries apparently. So it was just... A breath of fresh air, not to have to deal with all that crap. But you know, there's still some pretty awesome fans around, I guess, and some good people. And you know, still the odd kid that um, was shouting out your name, and you give him a couple of uh, caffeine gels to <laughs> <laughs> send them home to the parents. Exactly, we've all done it, haven't we? <laughs> hey, how do you how do you boys go with that when you get an article written about you that you go, oh, jeez, that's bullshit? Do you literally do you take it up with the journal afterwards, or do you just go, all right, well, next time you want an exclusive, you can jam it up your pipe bowl? Yeah, I think I owe Wade Wallace an apology because I sent him a pretty uh, aggro message, not personally to him, but about yeah. one of his journalists that. For some reason, I don't know what I ever did, but I've really insulted him. <laughs> I absolutely hates my guts. You know? It gets quite personal at times. So it's uh, yeah, there's just so many of them, aren't there? Though they just don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> it. There's one. There's one thing worse though. It's, it's um, Dutch. Dutch fans is the, the most critical nation of. I mean, there's some awesome Dutch fans, but I tell you what. The amount of like Twitter messages I get, like where, like I knew after stage one, I wasn't, I was not having a good Tour de France. I was just buckled. But people could probably, like most Kiwis and Aussies and stuff, they saw, oh yeah, he's he's pretty banged up and he's trying his hardest. But like, or they either said, oh good to see you trying, or they didn't say anything. But for some reason, so many Dutchies felt the need to say, hey, you're not up to standard. So yeah. just just a little at George Bennett on Twitter, just to let you know, mate, why are you creeping? You know, and you're oh. like, you know, you just ah, oh, like yeah. I don't read. I try not to read them. But I, don't yeah, yeah. Just, I don't think I've ever had an article written about me, so I can't complain <laughs> about. <laughs> no, you got a bit of press when you crashed out. What are you talking? Yeah, about? Yeah, I got a bit of press when I crashed out. Actually, yeah. Yeah, you got heaps of support. That. Yeah, need well, more, more of them. We, we need to let Richie go away. We can't keep yeah. him. Uh, hey, mate, yeah, yeah, mate, all of them. You're a bloody legend, mate. We're bloody yep. stoked that you came on the show and we're absolutely fucking proud of you. Good luck Thanks at the Worlds. Um, and we'll see you boxing. I can't wait to get back in the peloton when, when I'm healed and box on with you again. I love it. On a serious note, though, George, tip my hat to you, mate. You bloody punched on like an absolute champion. You know, Thanks, stage, mate. Stage 19, that was ridiculously hard. And you came back and uh, single-handedly got me on the podium because I had bad legs that day and you rode a, a solid tempo. So thanks a lot. <laughs> oh, man, happy, happy to be of service. Thanks, Richie. Uh, I'll see you on Sunday, mate. See you in uh, Italy. Boys. Take it easy. Good on you, mate. Thanks, no mate. No worries, mate. Bloody legend. Take it easy. Hooroo. See you later. <laughs> see you, mate. Absolute legend. I'm That's glad we got gold. A That's story. a great chat. I'm glad. Yeah. That's, I, I love it. I love it when... People come on this show and you can tell straight away they feel comfortable. Like we mm. try and create a comfortable environment. There's no bullshit and they can just be themselves, you know. Yeah. And those mm. insights, like it, it is hard. And as a professional athlete, as you said, George, like you get a lot of critics, you get a lot of people that try and knock you off your perch or whatever. But, um, 
yeah, it's the ability to just bloody block all that sort of shit out. Um, but I like the fact he doesn't forget. Like he's yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's got a black book. He's got a black book. Yeah, oh, yeah. And if your name goes in there, oh but it's yeah, because like with, with Richie, like I've had um, like. I remember the first time I ever rode against him was Tour of Romandy 2012. And he came up to me. And I knew, I mean, he was a bit of my idols, you know, like an Australian guy. And he just comes up to me. He's like, oh, I've heard about you. You're the, you're the guy from uh, Tour of Tasmania. And I was like, ah, oh. because the year before I nearly won Tour of Tasmania or two years before or something. And uh, just lost out on the last day, finished second or something. And um, He's like, oh, mate, that was really impressive and stuff. And I was just sitting there like, what the hell? Like, this guy just won the, he'd just been after, he'd been in the pink jersey. This guy knew me from Tour of Tasmania. Like, how is this possible? And then the next day, I just chopped him by mistake. I don't know what I was doing. And I just copped the wrath of Richie, you know? <laughs> and, and so we've always had this, like, like we're, we're, we're always good mates in the peloton. And but we always come, we always clash it down under in some form. Like, you know, and it's always because rivals because it's just a fierce competitor. And that's what's quite cool about, I think, about Australians and New Zealanders. They can be like, like you can have a blow up with someone in a racing context and then you can also laugh about it and go, remember that time we were screaming at each other's head and trying to ride each other off the road? Yeah, it was pretty funny, eh? <laughs> and then it's just good. But like, you don't hold a grudge or whatever, you know? It's, and maybe, but maybe that's an Aussie New Zealand thing. I don't know. Well, oh, for maybe. sure. Yeah, it is, and he, uh, he's just, he's just, he's actually just an Aussie bloke, man. He's just like he doesn't forget that stuff, but like he's a fighter, eh? And like, you, mm. like we were touched on the fact that he, he's had some, some shit luck at the Tour de France over the years. When he left, he left Sky to, um, to go and have his own opportunities to, to try to win the Tour de France, to try to finish on the podium. And like he's, like he said, it's his dream. You know, he finally achieved his dream of finishing on the podium in Paris, and. Um, mm. He had some shit luck. It was stage nine. He crashed out on stage nine two or three years in a row. Oh mate, I was I was there that day on uh, Mont du Chat or Col du Chat. I don't know. Um, oh yeah, and, that was a shock. Oh crash. mate, I was, yeah, I, was on, I was on a day that day, and I came. Richard just crashed. I came around the corner, and I was like, oh mate, he was. That was a crazy downhill, and everyone was like, everyone for days before was like, oh, there's no way we can race down this, and it was like set up as this big spectacle and then yeah they had the big spectacle and people crashed and Dan Martin broke his pelvis or his back mm. or something and Richie and then we were just like cool sweet spectacle now what you know like yeah now we're down two GC contenders yeah yeah no that was uh, a shocker yeah no but that was bloody bloody great of him to come on the show what a legend and yeah, yeah. Australia should be proud of him I want to oh, yeah. um I want to ask you Jonesy what the hell's going on with this background? Is there that's obviously related to the year that we're going to touch on? Yeah, we're going to talk about 1969. Uh, so we've we've we reckon that this could possibly be the greatest year in the history of the world. Mm. Like of, we we usually years. talk of years. Well, we talk about um, years that obviously we were alive for, and that we share these stories about you know doing shit results on year twelve bloody exams. No one cares about that. Let's oh, talk no. about like working at toothpaste factories. Yeah. No, but the, 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 the segment is hitters. any year better than 2020. So right. we didn't have to be alive. And no. and what's strange about 1969 <clears throat> is the it's the year without doing any research that I knew so much. Because just from just watching like four music documentaries, I already knew it enough to know that that was a year I should have been 21. If I could have been 18 to 25, if I could have been then, in 1969, that was my calling, you know. Yeah, and like, like you say, we're so, talking yeah. about years. We talk about years better than 2020. This is this year is better than any other year. We mm. had the moon landing. Mm. Yep. We had Woodstock. We had Sesame Street debuted. We had uh, the, what a show! Beatles the released Beatles, their first album. The Beatles, now their last album, Abbey Road. Oh, Abbey Road, sorry. And uh, uh, yeah. Led Zeppelin released their first album. That's uh, yeah. Led Zeppelin what? one. That was nice. Boeing, seven, Boeing 747's first ever commercial flight. What a year. What, wasn't it their last performance as well on the rooftop? Yeah, Beatles? and it got, got shut down by the cops. Did it? Yeah. Were they, it was they a scared, did they, were they going to play for ages or something? I don't know. I could have asked John um, or Ringo or anyone like that what, well, what their plan was. Well, but. well here's, an, here's another zinger for you, boys, is think about obesity. 
Back then, it was 13% among the population. Now we're over 35%. And it was 5% to 7% Do you think that's because everyone was just chewing their face off on, on drugs for part, 1969? That's, that's part of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bottled water sales and lollipops went through the roof. <laughs> um, it, it's the Macca's revolution. It's fast food. Like, obviously, yeah. you know, now with Uber Eats, you know, if you want to get fat, I mean, it's, it's a thumbprint mm. away. Like, um, back then... You know, mum's cooking meatloaf, casseroles, you know, it was family dinners. It was like proper proper tucker. And also, um, you know what? People didn't play bloody PlayStation or computer games. What you no. did is you, you went outside with no helmet on your bike, no knee pads, no nothing. You jumped no. your shitty little BMX bike. You built the biggest ramp you could on the main street. You got all the kids in the, in the street to come out into the cul-de-sac there. And let's try and jump this bus. You know, I like how you're rem- you're reminiscing about 1969 when you were born in 86, 87. <laughs> well, that's, that's what we're doing, isn't well, it? It's like, it's like that TV show, The One you're the Runner Years. Yeah. I remember, yeah. you know, we used to build these jumps. Well, you, didn't have to, you, didn't have to, you didn't have to lock your doors. You know, yeah. when it got hot, you just played under the sprinkler. You um, left your car keys. You, left, you got out... And that was the thing. You didn't go to McDonald's because, you know, you went to the, the mum and pop stores to buy your bread yep. and, you know. Yeah, those, right. those... You guys fucking sound like baby boomers that have just, you know, the, the world's changed underneath their feet. But <laughs> my, actually, like the whole hippie revolution thing was pretty special. And my old man was, was oh, he was he was depth in there. And um, he told me this story that he, um, he was always into his, science and things like that and he he got accepted into medical school but he had super long hair and uh they said oh if you want to you know start medical school you have to cut your hair and um he was just like at that time his whole vibe was like fuck the man you know and uh so so he just he just gave it the flick and didn't be didn't be I guess there's a doctor. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> you <laughs> went to medical school. Today, hey? <laughs> so your, your internet you, you, cut out just as you were saying, doctor, I think. Mm. Are you still connect, Are you still connected to the Campanile um, oh. in Paris? Their, their Wi-Fi or something or what? <laughs> uh, yeah, right, I don't mate. know. I'm having some issues. Don't, don't worry, yeah, mate. You, you yeah, tried yeah. your best for that. Hey, you'll be right. <laughs> um, the, the, I did a bit of research on um, Woodstock. And that story is an absolute belter. So, like, it was the four guys that came together and they, they were in it to make money. And there was two sort of music sort of guys, two entrepreneurs, and they sort of had this idea and they, they sold a shit ton of tickets at the start. I think they made, like, 1.8 mil or whatever. But then as it got nearer to the show, they were going to play it in Woodstock, but then they all cracked the shits. So then they were going to play it, like, in this other joint called uh, Whale Kill or something. Uh, and then they said, no, nah, you're not playing it here. So 30 days out, they're screwed. They're like, oh, shit, what are we going to do? And that um, the farmer, the dairy farmer, Max, uh, I can't even remember, Max Yaska, he goes, yeah, no, you can And this guy was here. quite conservative, but he was quite yeah. a conservative guy, which was just yeah. nuts because, you know, you had all these hippies just coming in and he was this conservative farmer, but he, yeah. and they, they decimated so, so, his farm. 350,000 so like, people on LSD. <laughs> well, he said, yeah, you can play it here. But the, the thing that caused all the crowds was three days out. They had to make a call. They go, well, okay, we, we've only got enough resource. We can either build a fence and build a ticketing booth or we just put all our effort into the stage. And they go, all right, fuck it. We'll do the stage and it's a free concert. So that's when everyone lost their shit. A million people were heading down. Cars were parked in the streets. They couldn't get down there. People were getting out and walking. And then when they hit the hit the concert... The first night, it was like, you know, they had all these awesome bands like Creedence, The Who, and all this sort of stuff. And they're like, ah, oh, we didn't plan this. Like, there's not enough toilets, you know, <laughs> there's not enough food. Like, there was no food. People were like running out of tucker. So they airdropped 10,000 pickled sandwiches like, after the first night. <laughs> what? 10,000 pickled sandwiches they airdropped. The, the army had to come in and just drop these sangers so that people weren't killing over. And they reckon it just turned into this like absolute shit show, but there was no fighting because everyone's yeah, yeah. kite. We got all the hippies, and the you know everyone's rooting in the swamp. Like they don't give a stuff. <laughs> but it was like everyone had to muck in there because it was it was like a war zone because even yeah. just the muck. The rain came on. Like, rain, I, yeah. 
and then it just so, flooded the tents, everything. And I remember like seeing, like, I think it was like the band ten years after. They they were, I think they were one of the first, and they were meant to, and because the traffic had backed up, like kilometers down the road, and they were yeah. like, "We're on in ten minutes." And they, yeah, we're, we're about six hour drive from the place now, and so they so, were choppering in people. And, oh, like, it was a, and, it was an absolute shit show. They were saying by the end because there wasn't proper toilets and that. They said it was actually, you know. It was a bit of a nasty sort of environment. <laughs> so people are starting to clear out. The Jimi Hendrix performance happened at 8.30 a.m. on the Monday. <laughs> yeah, on the Monday. This Monday is morning, 8.30 a.m. And you're watching Hendrix shoot his guitar. Because I was watching this docker and they said, nah, overall, the, the organizer said it was a success and there was only two deaths and two births. <laughs> two births. <laughs> <laughs> so they came two. out as... Of- a, a, a zero, you know, net sum of zero. So, or they got yeah, we, yeah, we cancelled each other out. Like, yeah, how, was how many, how many conceptions? I wonder though. Oh, oh. mate, there would have been a Woodstock boom. Yeah, um, yeah, but by course. the time, by the time Jimmy was playing, it was only to twenty five thousand. Everyone right. had just sort of said, "Ah, oh, I'm, I'm Woodstocked out." <laughs> Run out of pickle sandwiches. Yeah, but um, Run there's a acid. there's a big um uh, museum. I think you can go. Um, where the concert was. I think they've kept the stage and you can go and there's a big monument and that, but yeah. Unbelievable. So was there, no, seen that was there no limit? Was there no limit on Woodstock, like time? It wasn't like a 24-hour concert. It just was like... It was five three, days. Go. Three, three days, I think. Oh, but but was that planned? Five, I think. Turned yeah. to five, yeah, because of the weather or whatever. Um, yeah, no, they originally planned for three and then they were saying because they didn't charge for tickets, the organisers were in debt for 10 years and they only <laughs> made their money back from the movie that... They released, and now obviously you know Woodstock merch or whatever. But I didn't do any research on when they tried to revive it in '99. That was a balls up. When, how did uh, they, they um how, how did they pay the gigs then? If, if they weren't charging a buck for a ticket or whatever, how did they pay to get Hendrix in this they, one? Well, they'd sold 1.8 million tickets, so I'd say they would have said to those people, "Well, it's free for anyone after if you haven't bought a ticket." But I'd say those people that pre-bought a ticket got got rolled because they blew mm-hmm. all their money. Before the concert got fired up, I think Hendrix charged eighteen grand or something, and they spent two hundred and fifty grand in um, performers and stuff. So, yeah, eighteen grand. I mean, they did like try and build a fence. They did try yeah. and build a fence for a while. Like the original intention, they were building this fence, and then they were just like, "Whoa, this nah. fence ain't stand up." No, nah. <laughs> and that and that fucking stage. You know, we've only got one bloody amp. We better get onto that. This so. is a story of two colossally like like. This is a real spectrum. You've got like some hippies that couldn't build a fence, and then you've got a space agency that landed on the moon in the same oh, year. Yeah. You know, like yeah. there was there was two spectrums operating in 1969. Mate, do you know what I found out about the moon landing? Um, <laughs> when I was googling it, you know, when I was I was doing my research before the show, which uh, uh, was about 15 minutes before we hit record, I thought I'd better do some research. You know, the moon landing. So there's Buzz Aldrin oh, no. and there's Neil Armstrong. They went to the moon. They landed on the moon in 1969. Was there, anyone, that, there was another guy in there. There as well, was a wasn't third it? guy. I didn't even know that. Michael Collins. Yeah, Colo. Oh. He didn't even get oh, to he didn't even, he didn't yeah. even step foot. He didn't even step foot on the thing. Oh, he why was, not? You've gone all that way. You've gone all just, that way. It's like he was just floating like, around, waiting. It's like driving up to the lookout and then just not stepping out of your car and like, oh, I can sort of see it pretty well from here, you know? Or yeah, like re- just, re- reversing into the lookout. Yeah, facing the other way, facing into the car park. <laughs> but just on it, it, if you believe some people, you know, it was all done in a studio anyway, Bills. Like, yeah, that's right. You know, what what do you miss out on? Yeah, Buzz. Someone said that to Buzz Aldrin uh, about thirty years later, and he knocked him out, didn't he? Yeah, he knocked him over. Well, yeah. well, he's he's going to be the legend or ballend later yeah. on in the Bills. Yeah, oh, I reckon. So it's weird though because why did Neil Armstrong? Why was he? Who, what do they do? They rock off. Like they get there in the street nah, and they so, go, right, one of us is going to stay in the ship. We'll rock off between who's going to stay in, who's going to be first man, who's going to be second. No, nah, so that, so I, I Googled that as well. I was like, why the hell did Neil get the bloody rights, you know? And um, Buzz, he didn't step foot on, on the moon until 19 minutes later. So Neil had already stuffed to join out. Um, mm. So like Buzz Aldrin, he was he was a real like Tenzi Norgay of the moon landing, really, you know? Yeah, um, carried all the bags. Yeah, carried all the bags. 
<laughs> so, anyway, so once you once you got the bags, put the bags down, you got the going. But the so Buzz Buzz was the um, pilot, and he he and Neil Neil Armstrong was like the leader of the mission. And the and initially, um, Buzz Aldrin was supposed to be the first guy to step onto the moon. That was all planned by NASA. Well, that's and fair we, too. If he's the pilot, mate, you got us here. You should yeah. go out first. What's and this Neil, bloody Neil Armstrong done? He ain't done shit. Well, because Neil yeah. was because Neil was the leader of the um, of the campaign. He he the protocols meant that he had to stay on board. He had to be the last guy off because in case of an emergency, he needed to be the one who who did oh, all the, yeah. did all this shit to make sure you know they weren't stuck on the moon. So that was the plan. Buzz would get off. Neil would make sure everything was safe. Then he would get off. They changed it the last minute, and NASA told Buzz that the reason they were doing it was because um, because of where they were sit- seated in the module. So Neil was closer to the door, basically. So he got the guy go first. That's what they told him. But in the end, what actually happened came out years later was NASA recognised that Neil Armstrong had such a big ego, and Buzz didn't, um, that Neil was gonna was gonna handle it better by being the first off. You know, if they if they didn't. Let Neil get off first. Shit was going to hit the fan. Whereas Buzz was going to be a bit more like, ah, oh, I don't really give a fuck. I'm tending to I'll drop the bags <laughs> off and jump off, you know. So that's why in the end they let Neil go. But um, but yeah, Buzz was supposed to be the first man, and he didn't get to stand on there until 19 minutes later. Yeah. Really? So yeah, yeah. But he's it wasn't Buzz's old man was pissed off. Like his old man was a pilot, and he wanted his son to be the first on the moon, and. I think he did a bit of media, and, and I heard an interview with Buzz saying, "Yeah, I was just embarrassed. Like the old man should have just shut up, you know, like real bitter. He's just also, sort of bit, bit like Richie Port with the journos. He's just like, it's fired up. And but also Buzz, Buzz was um he was the most experienced space traveler. So he he'd um he'd knocked up over the course of the in the sixties there. He'd he'd done um he'd already done a couple of other missions one you know there was apollo 11 which was obviously the moon landing and then he'd done this one called gemini a couple of years prior which was basically a spacewalk so they flew up in space so he was the first guy to do a spacewalk and he was the innovator he was the one who who basically was discovered and taught everybody how to join two modules so they had the they had the the orbiting module that they had to get to first where they left old michael collins when they pissed off to the moon um so they had to learn how to dock that ship into Apollo 11 into that into that mo- module floating around in the, in the space to drop Michael off to get the bloody dinner on, mm. and um, <laughs> and um, so he'd actually so Buzz had actually done the most time in space. He'd done, already done 12 days worth of space travel, 290 hours. Whereas old Neil, he'd done not even half that. I think he'd done about six or seven days. Of yeah, space right. You know what that's like? That's like you know you're in an EOS situation where you know you got. <laughs> Uh, Carapaz and Kwiatkowski going to the line, and and that would have been the same if, if Kwiatkowski had just, you know, you got uh, you got Kwiatkowski, the, the experienced guy. He's done seven Tour de France's with the team. He's carried the team a lot of the way, and you got a new guy, first year on the team. Hot, you know, he's big talent. Everyone knows, you know, he knows he's good. And then they get to the line, and and he just line scabbed him. And if, if, you know, if Carapaz won that stage, that that's like a real Neil Armstrong kind of move, you know? Is that how, they, how did they work that out with the just on that Katowski Carapaz? Did they get told in the year this is how it's going down, or did they work it no, out? No, I think, I think they kind of said, oh, you should win the Mountains jersey. Um, I'll take the stage, and you've already yeah. won the Giro. Yeah. And also, Kwiatkowski had been in that team and worked his ass yeah. off for five Tour de France victories for them. Mm. Uh, yeah, you no, couldn't probably. really give that to you couldn't you couldn't really. And the other thing is, I had this experience with Hayden Rolston once, where we were both coming aligned together at nationals, and he's like, "Oh, I'm going to take the win," and I was like, "Oh, okay, whatever," you know. He said, "Oh, you'll win heaps of these," and I never won one since. But, um, <laughs> uh, but what, what, what it comes down to is, if we actually raced for it, he would have beaten me. And if those two had actually raced for it that day, Piato would have would have pummeled him in the sprint. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah so. that's a good point. So and you better off look like a good terrible. dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Terrible, terrible for the team. It looks terrible for the team to see these boys lining up in a kick. Just yeah. like, and, yeah. and the way they went across the line was was cool. Great oh, photo. Special. Great for the team. Yeah. Special. It was special. Absolutely yeah, it was special. Nice. 
Uh, um, so so good for the sport too. <laughs> but don't you think Buzz and Buzz and Neil could have um, could have arranged some kind of simultaneous foot first on the ground, arms across each well, other? They should have gone up there with a deck of cards, high low card. Yeah, or, you know, just had a game of gin rummy or just sorted it out like men. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's um, just boxed let's... on for a bit. First yeah. one wins. You know, like the door, three, two, one, go. Yeah, <laughs> we're we'll fighting for it, mate. I'm, I realize how big this is. Games changed. Yeah, we're so we're so <laughs> stuck on the uh, on the moon landing. We might as well just continue talking about Buzz because he's our legend of Balin today. Yeah, yeah. Let's just keep let's just keep talking and how we're chatting now about it because it's going to work out perfectly. Because yeah, so, pe- people would be going, why are they just talking about Buzz? Like, yeah, what's going on? So Neil was supposed to stay on the ship, and Buzz was supposed to get off as we spoke yep. about about in case something happened, in case some emergency happened. Neil Armstrong and all his ego decided, nah, I'm getting off. Buzz was like, ah, oh, fucking whatever, you go for it, mate. I don't really give a shit. Um, but then, then what happened was an emergency. So they broke a they broke a switch to get what off sort the, of what sort to, of switch to get off the moon. So there's this one important switch. The get off switch. Yeah, like the ascent, the ascent switch. Without that switch, they couldn't get off the moon. Oh. So they. They were staring down the barrel. So Neil and all his bloody ego, who was supposed to stay on board, that was his responsibility. Yeah. He's cocked it up and broken the switch. So now they're stuck on the fucking first guys to land on the moon and first guys to first guys were stuck there. <laughs> yeah. So they so what, what happened in that situation was they called NASA. They're like, uh, Houston, we have a problem. Yeah. Um we broke that'd, the be the, that'd be the blame game too. It'd be going, yeah. it was that yeah, fucking they, Armstrong. I told you. Yeah. He's trouble. Actually, Armstrong would have gone, yeah, buzz. They, yeah. Actually had, they, they had actually had an argument prior to that because someone took a shit and, and the shit was floating around the ship. <laughs> You're making this up now. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. That's the original floater. Oh. And that's the original floater. <laughs> it didn't flush. It didn't flush. And there was this, sh- there was this like, shit floating around. This module. So, so, this so, lunar so module. Mean... And they were pointing <laughs> fingers. Wasn't me. I flushed mine. <laughs> so that already been. That already been. That's bad. that's that's one small shit for man. <laughs> <laughs> That's one giant stink for Matt Gain. Oh, what well, that would put you in a you wouldn't get over that. You no. would have ruined your moment thinking I'm duck diving this bloody Grogan before I'm climbing up to the moon. Like it just would have rattled me. I'd be filthy. And like no way of predicting where that shit's going. No grand. Yeah, yeah. It's just like it could be anywhere. It could, you know, you, you could be east. sneaking up on your shoulder. So Buzz was on. He was on shrimp cocktails. That's what he was eating up. This is also true. They asked him what he wanted to eat for dinner up there. He took he took a week supply of shrimp cocktails. So he was eating so- shrimp. He's in shrimp, shrimp cocktails trying to dodge this Grogan. <laughs> oh, man. This story. How is this not the real story of the moon landing? Yeah. And oh so, <laughs> um, so, yeah, so they broke back to the so, switch. They, so, they no, no, the back, no, before you go, whose shit was it? Was it Buzz's no, no, or no, 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 no. It was so Collins. It was Big Collo. <laughs> Collo. Neil, yeah, maybe, maybe Collo goes. Well, if I'm not going, I'm leaving you a present. <laughs> See, boys. If I can't go to the moon, at least a part of me's going. Yeah. Um, okay. Anyway, so they they had the switch broken, so it's all panic stations. Yeah, you know, that's the classic Houston. We have a problem. So Neil's Neil's raided into NASA, and they said, um, "Yeah, look, you're going to have to give us overnight to work that to work that out." Um, but you, you are staring down the barrel of. Uh, never, never getting off the moon because we, you need you need we, that switch. But we, we we need we need a day to work out how to how to do it. So Neil 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 Armstrong's panicking, and shitting himself like I'm never going to get home. Also on this, none of them had life insurance, so there's no payout for the family because they couldn't afford it. Mm. So they're um they're stuck on the moon. Neil sh- shit himself, <laughs> literally, probably by the sounds of it. <laughs> And Buzz Aldrin just was like, oh, well, fuck it. So he shut it down. He slept in a 12-hour nap on the moon. First really? guy, Yeah, first guy to urinate on the moon. Just pissed in his suit. 
Did he? Then, yeah, because they could like you doing a wetsuit. They were supposed to be back at the lunar module floating around oh, yeah. a couple, couple hours later. He needed to go for a piss, so he just put in the suit. Um, but then he was the one who worked it out. So what he did is he just got his pin, his biro, he just plugged it into the hole where the switch was and flicked the Flicked pin it. up and, and off they went. Oh. So he, all because of this pin uh, and Buzz Aldrin's ingenuity, they got off the moon. Yeah. He's well, the real would, ten, the Tenzin Norgay of the moon landing. It would, piss you off. it would piss you off knowing what you did on that journey and, you know, all the effort you went to to dodge the Grogan, to not have a biffo with <laughs> uh, Armstrong, to fix it with the switch, to have – People still question if you did it. I've got that video of when he um, smacked that bloke in the chops. I'll play oh, it now. You're the one who said you walked on the moon when you didn't. Calling the kettle black if I ever thought of it. Saying Will I misrepresented myself. Get away from me. You're a coward and a liar and a thief. And a thief. And a thief. And a thief. What a legend. What a legend. He needed to be, that guy needed a punch in the face. There was no other, you know what I mean? No. Like, no, it's that's right. It's not for him to say. And um, but you know the thing with Buzz again, like it was just destiny for him. So his mother's maiden name was Moon. So her obviously her last name was Aldrin when she married Buzz's old man. But her maiden name was Moon. So right. it was that was destiny. It was destiny for Buzz quick, to go. Quick to the side moon. note on that: I went to school with a girl, and her last name was Mooney. And you'll never guess what her first name was. Chucker. Paula. <laughs> Paula oh, Mooney. Mooney. Oh. <laughs> Fuck <I don't>... me. <laughs> Paula Mooney. You can imagine you get how it? interesting. Do you get like, it, Paula Mooney? I don't get it. Like, like Paula, Paula Mooney. Mooney. Paula Mooney. Oh, Paula Mooney. Oh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Mm. Imagine how entertaining that is to a 10-year-old. Anyway, so another another good thing that Buzz did, which I wrote about him, he, he they couldn't afford life insurance. So what they did, Buzz, Michael Collins, um, and Neil, is they signed all these autographs before they went and gave it to their families and said, if we don't make it back, if we can't oh, yeah. get this, if we can't get this pin to get us off the moon, um, sell our autographs to, to make some money. You know, if that's that's going to be would have been insurance. valuable. Yeah, yeah, yeah hmm. absolutely. They would have been. Um, that's that's right. gonna, that, that was going to be the insurance. So he was flat broke, but Buzz couldn't buy his insurance to go to the moon. He sent NASA, when he got back from the moon landing, he sent NASA a expense sheet for $33.31, charging them for his travel fee from Houston to the moon and back. Thirty-three bucks, he <laughs> thirty-three dollars expense fee. Probably what it cost him for that pin. That's hilarious. Yeah. How, how could this guy not be rated as a legend? Yeah, like, that, I don't even know what I've got, got on the dirt on. There's no dirt on him. Like, oh, yeah. Maybe we actually, go Neil. Maybe we go Neil Armstrong, legend of Belling. because yeah, you know, I'm leaning yeah. towards Belling on that. No, exactly, and I reckon one hundred percent it was Neil's turd. Like, <laughs> yeah. Buzz, Buzz wouldn't have done that. Buzz would have sorted the flush out. If he can fix the problem with the exactly. switch, he would have worked the toilet out. It would have been Armstrong for sure. The only the only bad thing I found about um, Buzz, you know, the only thing that he, he sort of failed in was he didn't handle the fame well after after the moon landing. So he came back to the came back to Earth. He he retired from NASA two years later, 1971, and he, he went, he like, went into the depths of depression and alcoholism. Um, he abused his girlfriend. He just, you know, he couldn't handle the the fame of it all. And then at a certain point, he was like, he had depression. He had no money coming in, no income. He didn't want to, want to be part of the fanfare. He didn't want to do these speeches that he does now. You know, he could have made millions of bucks by selling his story or writing books, which he did down the line. But at that point, he wasn't, he wasn't into it. So he was like, fuck, how am I going to make a buck? So he became a car salesman. Yeah. yeah, so he, he came he became a car salesman in Beverly Hills. He didn't sell one single car. Yeah, because he's too honest. He's too honest. Yeah. yeah. Legend. Too honest. Yeah. I mean, if you're selling cars, if you're selling cars like bloody, you know, they're going off like hot hot things, you're just whipping them off, you, you're greasy. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And how many times would a buzz been pissed off when people come up and they're looking at going, yeah, I'm thinking about getting a cat. Hey, 
hang on. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. ready. Yeah. Because he wouldn't have had the notoriety of Neil. That'd no. piss you off. Mm. That'd piss you off. Yeah. And then you'd be at the point where you're like, you know what? You don't want this car, mate. Piss yeah. Shit. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> We've already sold it. Move on. Move on. Yeah. Mate, what are you doing? It's not working. <laughs> He's also a um, he's also a Freemason. Oh yeah, what do they do again? I don't know. <laughs> well, that's the whole thing about being, being a Freemason is for secret society. George yeah. Bush. Ah. It's, it's almost like the Illuminati, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he, he's a yeah. member of two Freemason Freemasonary um, clubs. Well, it's like the it's states. like the um, Simpsons episode, the Stone Mason. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Attached, it's, it's, it's attached to Rock of Pride <laughs> rock of shame. and <laughs> attached to Rock of Shame. Oh. Hey, hey, um, so the yeah, well, I'd say if you're voting on Neil Armstrong, I'd have to say, yeah, he's a bit of a bit of a bell end. He didn't really do any interviews after about the whole expedition, did he, Bills? Uh, I, I didn't do any research on Neil Armstrong, mate. I did it all on Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know anything about Neil George other than he's a bell end? Nah, it sounds like it sounds like something I can get behind, so. And and Balance. Neil was the one that was eating the shrimp cocktails, or was Buzz? No, that was Buzz. He was running uh, the shrimp cocktail diet. Yeah. Well, that yeah. I've, I've got to let that shit go. That story, but you could have just looked for shrimp. Like if you saw shrimp in it, that's it. It's Buzz. Yeah. Anyway, I, I stand oh. by it was Michael Collins. All right, yeah, Collins. Oh. Now okay. before before we wrap it up, I want to play this Kiwi ad that symbol that just wraps up the year nineteen sixty nine. Back in the day when men's fashion wasn't cutting it, modern Kiwi males demanded more from their casual attire, but what they actually got was less. A whole lot less, as they welcomed in stubbies, available mostly in brown and in a frightening one size too small. Finally, the Kiwi male was able to liberate his thighs to a breathless country, and his puku, and his bum. Features included a handy front key pocket, although no key could fit in it, which was cool, because back then, well, people just left their keys in the car anyway. Now, any social occasion was one men could feel comfortable in as they drank their LMP while their mullets sheltered their necks from the long summer sun that burned on and on. You were there, and so was LMP. World famous in New Zealand since ages ago. Good, Good on you, man. LMP. I'm going to crack a can right now. Hey. Okay. Hmm? Yeah. What? Does, oh. oh, my internet's gone to shit, but does that make you a little bit homesick when you see the ad? No. <laughs> Billy, yeah. you've, sent, you've sent me a message. We, just, oh, <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed. We, we had one job to do three weeks ago. We were presented through the good folk at the Miller Resort in the Maldives, we were presented with a prize valued at 10000 US dollars. Like that was a, a five nights oh, yeah. accommodation, <laughs> waterfront. And all we had to do, all we had to do is mention Miller.com resort, like uh, go there, visit it, support the Maldives, check it all out um, and plug them as much as we could. We didn't even mention it last week on the show, Bills. We haven't. We we spoke last week about the Maldives, and we didn't even say about the Miller Resorts. We, what the hell have we been doing? And we that oh. was number one on the agenda mm. today. Number one. We're now an hour in, and we've just remembered. We're sorry, guys. We are sorry. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's embarrassing. So um, what what we're going to do? Right, we're going to regroup. We're going to regroup. We're going to give people two more weeks to. Uh, have the opportunity to win this prize. We said it'd be at the end of the tour. We're going to have to extend that because we are useless. Uh, we So tune into our social media um, and we will plug the competition. We're going to be launching some cool stuff over the next couple of weeks. Uh, thanks for everyone that's been submitting like ideas for merch. Uh, Caitlin's brain's running wild, George, for different designs or things that we can do. Um and yeah, we'll we'll have all our shit sorted over the next couple of weeks for sure. But 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 we will remind you, this is real, guys. I'll tell you this what, will, I'm actually we'll be giving away. Yeah, yeah, and I'm also oh. so excited to actually go there myself. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so the website is www.amilla.com. Amilla.com. Amilla.com. 
Can you not just bring it up on the screen? Yeah, I can. Um, you give me two seconds. <laughs> who's the people that are watching on YouTube? There are a lot of people are going to be asking who's Danny. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, that was just something I've stolen off the net. <laughs> yeah, do, uh, it, I actually know this um, design because I was going to make a shoe design on it, and then Captain was like, "Why do you want Danny on your shoes?" And I was like, "There it is. One. www.amilla.com. Go to that website, guys." A M I double L A dot com. com. And massive and thanks to Jason and Victoria and the crew there. Jason was on the show a couple of weeks ago. He's an absolute legend. He's got no uh, traits of a bell end, which is great. And um, yeah, he does a great job at that resort. You look at the photos and you're just like, holy moly. Yeah. It's so, yeah, stay tuned, guys. As Jason says, we're working on a project that we're that we just started a couple of days ago that will be launched in the next week or two. Um, yep. So look out for that. And that's when the prize will be announced. Um, and one of you lucky buggers will be, one of you lucky legends will be spending yeah. five nights at www.amilla.com in the yep. middle. Boys, right, that was right. an awesome show. Right. I yep. really enjoyed that. Thanks yep. Richie. That was good. Thanks to you guys. Yep. Heal up, George. We'll, uh, oh, thanks. Speak, speak to you again soon, mate. Days. What do you mean yeah, heal up, George? Yeah, I'm the one here with. I'm the one sitting yeah, with four broken bones. You just told George to heal up. Well, he's got to race the world. <laughs> he's got shit to do. Hey, we can do a we can do a world recap on this show. Writes itself when you do bike races. We can do a world yeah. recap next week. Yeah, well, let's get on another um, cyclist who get the. Well, one let's wait out. and see who wins the worlds and then get them on. Yeah, why not? Hopefully, I'm it's on. someone on my contact list. Yeah, I think exactly. Walt Art's going to win anyway, so he'll yeah, come on. Yeah, All right, perfect. All right. All, right. All right, stay tuned. Next week, we're going to have the world champion on, and you could be <laughs> going to the Maldives. We'll see you then. Imagine, imagine if Lutsenko or someone wins, and we're like, fuck me, what do we do? <laughs> we just got to get someone speaking Kazakh to come and translate for the boys. <laughs> we'll be right. Yeah, we'll work it yeah. out. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Great show, we guys. Ask him, we, we could ask him why he keeps shaking his head at Richie. Did you reckon that's who we're talking about? <laughs> no, I don't know. I'm going to watch, though. I'm going to watch I'm going to watch Richie's patterns closely in the peloton and see who starts shaking their head. Yeah. <laughs> okay. See you later. All right. All right. All right. See you guys. All right.